We will continue in Acts chapter 21, and then we're going to finish up in Acts 22 today. Well, when we left Paul, he was in Jerusalem to celebrate Shavuot, Pentecost, after spending many years of establishing believing congregations in Macedonia and in Asia. Now, he had just begun to perform the ritual purification procedures that James, that's Yeshua's half-brother, the supreme leader of the way, had instructed him to do. And beginning in Acts 21, 20 through verse 24, James explains that Paul is to pay for, participate in, the vow offerings and all other elements needed for four believers who are under a Nazarite vow to bring their vows to the proper termination. Now, the purpose of this exhibition is for Paul to publicly demonstrate his fidelity and his devotion to halakha, to Jewish law, because many Judean Jews have been convinced that Paul has abandoned his Jewishness. He ceased following the law. He's telling others to do so, and thus he has apostatized from Judaism. Now, since Paul has been operating strictly in the foreign nations of the diaspora, these slanderous rumors about Paul's anti-law, anti-Jewish teaching have been brought to Jerusalem by diaspora Jews traveling there for the various pilgrimage festivals, like this one, Shavuot. Well, verse 26 explains that Paul did exactly what James suggested. Now, one might reason that any Christian would read this passage and immediately understand that Paul followed the law just as he claimed on several occasions that he does. Yet what we find with most of the early church fathers, especially those who were affiliated with the Rome-based church leadership council, is that they insist that while Paul indeed did what James told him to do, he did it only under duress. And he was entirely insincere about it. Some of the church fathers, like Chrysostom, go so far as to claim that Paul was merely playing the role of a good law-abiding Jew. But in fact, it was all a planned deception that God had designed for him. And the purpose of this deception is so that Jews would give Paul an audience for him to speak the gospel to them. Thus, to put it nicely, Paul was just pretending to be a believing Jew who followed the law in order that he would have more opportunities to spread the good news. Well, I profoundly condemn such a false and agenda-driven interpretation. It's a doctrine that many mainstream Christian denominations still adhere to in our day. The only way one can draw such a strange conclusion is if one begins from the church doctrine that Paul was anti-law even anti-Jewish to some degree, and insists on reading that, promise, that premise rather back into the scriptures because otherwise that is simply not in there. Well, Paul and the four believers purified themselves, meaning they immersed in a mikveh. Then they went to an outer court of the temple where they reported their purification to a priest, and it was verified that they could now enter a seven-day waiting period, after which they were considered ritually pure enough to bring their vow sacrifices to the altar. But just before that seven-day period ended, some unbelieving Jews from Asia who were in Jerusalem for Shavuot spotted Paul. They recognized him. They grabbed him while shouting out for, for support from the crowd. And they accused him of teaching people not to obey the law. 
and to have no regard for the temple. Further, they claimed, he has brought some Gentiles into the temple. No doubt meaning he took these Gentiles into areas that were off limits to them. Thus, Paul had knowingly and intentionally caused the temple to be defiled. Now, verse 29 explains that these visiting Jews had seen a fellow named Trophimus, a resident of Ephesus, um, accompanying Paul in Jerusalem and assumed, wrongly, that Paul had allowed this Gentile into the temple. Now, it must be understood that in Jewish law, such a thing was forbidden and it was cause for execution of the perpetrator. Even a Roman citizen was not exempt from such a severe consequence for trespassing into the holy precincts of the temple. Now, it's interesting to note that the Jews were so rigid on this issue of temple defilement by Gentiles that notices were posted, barriers were installed to keep the thousands of Gentiles who entered the temple to sightsee from accidentally wandering into the inner courts. And these signs were written in both Greek and Latin. So no excuse could be made for Gentiles trespassing on such holy grounds. This is not speculation. In fact, in the late 1800s, archaeologists uncovered an ancient sign on the Temple Mount, and it read like this. No foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who is caught trespassing will bear personal responsibility for his ensuing death. They were serious about this. Well, let's reread the final few, few verses of Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, we're going to start on page um, 1391 because we're going to start at verse 26. Acts chapter 21, starting at verse 26, we'll read to the end. Page 1391 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. The next day, Shaul took the men, purified himself along with them, and entered the temple to give notice of when the period of purification would be finished and the offering would have to be made for each of them. Now the seven days were almost up when some unbelieving Jews from the province of Asia saw him in the temple, stirred up all the crowd, and grabbed him. Men of Israel, help! They shouted. This is the man who goes everywhere teaching every one things against the people, against the Torah, against this place. Now he's even brought some Gentiles into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus from Ephesus in the city with him and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Well, the whole city was aroused and people came running from all over and they, were, they seized Shaul. They dragged him out of the temple and at once the gates were shut. But while they were attempting to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman battalion that all Jerusalem was in turmoil and immediately... He took officers and, and soldiers and he charged down upon them. And as soon as they saw the commander, they quit beating Shaul, Paul. Well, then the commander came up and arrested him. He ordered him to be tied up with two chains and he asked who he was, what he'd done. Everyone in the crowd shouted something different. So since he couldn't find out what had happened because of the uproar, he ordered him brought into the barracks. And when Shaul got to the steps, he actually had to be carried by the soldiers because the mob was so wild. The crowd kept following, screaming, kill him. And as Shaul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, is it all right if I say something to you? And the commander said, you know Greek. Say, aren't you that Egyptian who tried to start a revolution a while back and led 4,000 armed terrorists out in the desert? And Shaul said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of an important city, and I ask your permission to let me speak to the people. Well, having received permission, Paul stood on the steps and he motioned with his hand to the people, and when they finally became still, he addressed them in Hebrew. 
let's be clear. Every last accusation against Paul was a lie. A lie. He did not teach against the Jewish people. He did not teach against the law. He did not teach against the temple. Further, he did not bring some goyim, some Gentiles, into the temple, and thus he did not defile it. But of course, due to the zealous nature of Judean Jews, that is, Jews who lived in the province of Judea, and due to this humiliating occupation that had gone on so long by the Romans of the Holy Land, these were the exact accusations against someone that would have aroused the quickest and most volcanic emotional outburst among Jews. Now, let us not forget that this was happening during the holy biblical feast of Shavuot. So the feelings of religious piety among the Jews were all the more heightened. Now, it wasn't going to take much of a spark to set off riots. Thus, the local Roman military garrison that was co-located with the Temple Mount in the northwest corner of the walled area of the temple was on special alert during these Jewish holy days. Now, verse 31 explains that the crowd quickly swelled in size and agitation as Paul was forcefully dragged out of the temple and the gate shut behind him because the mob intended to kill him. Why not just kill him immediately instead of dragging him outside the temple courts? Because death is the worst sort of defilement. So it was illegal to kill anyone for any reason inside the temple grounds. The Roman soldiers stationed at the Antonia Fortress spotted all this turbulence. They reacted quickly. They showed up in a nick of time to rescue Paul. And the fortress, you see, was connected to the Temple Mount with only two flights of steps so that the Roman guards could rapidly respond to any threat. Now, interestingly, it was Herod the Great who had built that fortress, but he manned it with Roman soldiers. Then he named it after his patron, Mark Antony. Now, clearly, the point of building the fortress there on the Temple Mount was to discourage the riots and disturbances that happened regularly in uh, the temple area. Well, civil disorder was simply not tolerated by Rome. And so the Roman guard descended upon this mob in force and the mob quit beating Paul. Well, the commander of the troops at this time was a tribune. His name was Claudius Lysias. And he personally took charge of the situation to restore order. Now, since Shaul was the focus, focus of the crowd's anger, he was taken into custody. Paul was shackled. And Lysias decided to take him back to the barracks for interrogation. But before he led Paul away, he asked the mob to explain the problem to him. Well, everybody shouted something different. So he made no progress in ascertaining the charges against Paul. And as the soldiers started to, to, to head back to the barracks, the crowd erupted and the garrison literally had to carry Paul to protect him from continuing to be assaulted. Well, Lysias was going to have to get the truth then by other means. That meant persuading Paul to tell him. Of course, Paul was explaining that he'd done nothing wrong. So that's something Ly Lysias couldn't accept given all the circumstances. Well, inside the fortress, Paul spoke Greek to Lysias as he asked to have a word with him. And having begun life as a diaspora Jew, Greek was Paul's first language. Now, this surprised the commander because he was certain he had just arrested a notorious troublemaker and a wanted man known simply as the Egyptian. Now, apparently it was known that the Egyptian did not speak Greek. So Paul could not have been him. Now, Josephus speaks about this Egyptian. Apparently, he came to Jerusalem about three years earlier than the time we're at right now. 
And this charismatic leader managed to nearly overnight cobble together about 4,000 followers. Likely these were mostly members of the, the zealots and, and of the dreaded Jewish assassins called the Sakari. And he talked them into going to the Mount of Olives and then waiting there because at the appropriate moment, the walls of Jerusalem were just going to miraculously fall down, similar to the Jericho scenario. And then they'd be able to rush in and push the Roman troops out. However, the Roman governor got wind of this plan. He sent some soldiers against them. Many of the Egyptians' followers were killed, many more taken prisoner. Needless to say, the enormous limestone walls of Jerusalem remained intact, but the Egyptian was nowhere to be found. <clears throat> no doubt, had he resurfaced, those Jews he had abandoned would have been none too happy to see him. Apparently, Lysias figured that Paul must have been this mysterious Egyptian first, since the feelings against him were so strong, the Egyptian couldn't speak Greek, but Paul could. So Lysias knew he had the wrong man. Well, Paul now had the opening to explain just who he was. And he starts with the fact that he was from Tarsus, a well-known city in Cilicia. And would the tribune give Paul permission to speak to the crowd? While well, still trying to figure out just what crime Paul had committed, Lysias saw no harm in Paul's request. And although the complete Jewish Bible says that Paul addressed the mob in Hebrew, that's not quite the case. Rather, the verse says Paul spoke in the Hebrew language. What this is meaning to convey is the language that the Hebrew spoke. That's the idea of it. Now, so the question is, what language did the Hebrew speak? All current scholarship on the issue of language in the Holy Land is that Aramaic was the most universally spoken. However, Hebrew was also widely used, and the two languages are quite similar. So we can't be certain whether Paul spoke official Hebrew or Aramaic to that crowd. Well, let's move on to chapter 22. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 22. Again, if you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 1391. Acts chapter 22. Brothers and fathers, listen to me as I make, make my defense before you now. And when they heard him speaking to them in Hebrew, they settled down more, so he continued. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, trained at the feet of Gamaliel and every detail of the Torah of our forefathers. I was a zealot for God, as all of you are today. I persecuted to death the followers of this way, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The Kohen Haggadol, the high priest, and the whole Sanhedrin can testify to this. Indeed, after receiving letters from them to their colleagues in Damasek, Damascus, Syria, I was on my way there in order to arrest the ones in that city too and bring them back to Jerusalem for punishment. Now, as I was traveling and approaching Damasek, round noon, suddenly a brilliant light from heaven flashed all around me and I fell to the ground. I heard a voice saying to me, Shaul, Shaul, why do you keep persecuting me? And I answered, Sir, who are you? I am Yeshua from Nazareth, he said to me, and you are persecuting me. Those who were with me did see the light, but they didn't hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, well, what should I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up, go into Damasek, and there you will be told about everything that's been laid out for you to do. I had been blinded by the brightness of the light, so my companions led me by the hand into Damascus. A man named Hananiah, an observant follower of the Torah, who was highly regarded by the entire Jewish community there, came to me and he stood by me and he said, Brother Paul, see again. And at that very moment, I recovered my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers determined in advance that you should know his will. See the Sadiq, 
the righteous one, and hear his voice. Because you will be a witness for him to every one of what you have seen and heard. So now, what are you waiting for? Get up, immerse yourself, have your sins washed away as you call on his name. Well, after I had returned to Jerusalem, it happened that, I was, uh, that as I was praying in the temple, I went into a trance. I saw Yeshua. Hurry, he said to me, get out of Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept what you have to say about me. And I said, Lord, they know themselves that in every synagogue I used to imprison and flog those who trusted in you. Also, that when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I was standing there too, in full agreement. I was even looking after the clothes of the ones who were killing him. But he said, get going. I'm going to send you far away to the Gentiles. They had been listening to him up to this point, but now they shouted at the top of their lungs, rid the earth of such a man, he's not fit to live. They were screaming, waving their clothes, throwing dust into the air. So the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, directed that he be interrogated and whipped in order to find out why they were yelling at him like this. But as they were stretching him out with thongs to be flogged, Shaul said to the captain standing by, is it legal for you to whip a man who is a Roman citizen and hasn't even had a trial? Well, when the captain heard that, he went and reported it to the commander. He says, do you realize what you're doing? This man's a Roman citizen. The commander came and said to Shaul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, he said. The commander replied, well, I bought this citizenship for a sizable sum of money, but I was born to it. Shaul said. At once the men who had been about to interrogate him drew back from him and the commander was afraid too because he realized that he had put this man who was a Roman citizen in chains. However, the next day, since he wanted to know the specific charge that the Judeans were bringing against him, he released him and he ordered the head priest and the whole Sanhedrin to meet. Then he brought Shaul down and put him in front of them. I'd like to pause for just a few moments to interject a personal viewpoint. As I was studying and reading this chapter, I thought to myself, what a terrible state of agitation and anger that the Jews constantly lived under in Jerusalem because they were surrounded with immorality, idolatry, the stench of ritual uncleanness brought on by the presence of these brutal Roman soldiers trampling upon the Jews' holiest places. It's never, never a moment of tr true peace of mind. The Jews' highest religious authority, the priesthood, had become corrupt. And it was operated for the benefit of the wealthy Jewish aristocrats who were in league with their Roman occupiers. And then there were the throngs of the curious Gentiles who regularly visited Jerusalem in ever-increasing numbers since the days that Rome had made Judea a Roman province and bringing with them all manner of ritual impurities caused by their paganism. You know, it made me think about the state of this world, of the USA in particular, and, and in these early years of the 21st century. You know, we live in such an angry, frustrated, polarized society. It doesn't take too much to touch off riots, assaults, murders, even acts of terrorism or road rage. Confusion and chaos about what's right what's wrong things feel like they're spinning out of control so many of our deepest hopes now seem unattainable our cherished traditions are under constant attack and revision those of us who, who adhere 
to some form of Orthodox Judaism or fundamental Christianity find ourselves at serious odds with our government, our public schools, and of late, our entire secular culture in general. It seems that some new sort of legislated immorality, degradation, or ungodly social policy arrives every day. And when we refuse to knuckle under, we are deemed intolerant bigots. Religious nuts that are just full of hatred. Homeschooling is expanding rapidly, thank God. As dedicated parents remove their children from a school environment that bans God but embraces the LGBT movement and agenda. Teaches it to our children as a good, loving, admirable thing. People are leaving our churches and synagogues as more and more pastors and rabbis embrace the mantras and philosophies of the secular progressive agenda. And when I read these passages of Acts 22, you know what? I found myself identifying with those Jews, those Jews who attack Paul. I mean, they'd been told, and they believed, that Paul had joined the enemy, the Gentiles. And he, and, and he was teaching other Jews to abandon their heritage, ditch their traditions, their religion, their long-held values. Some Jews didn't care one way or the other, and they took it mostly in stride. But the ones who strove to diligently follow God and to be obedient to Him and those who loved their Israelite heritage and customs couldn't take it any longer. And they took strong action against a man who they thought to be symbolic of traitorous Jews who were deserting their Hebrew values and adopting Roman culture. Was it a wise or justifiable action on their part? Was it something that God would have wanted them to do? Well, I think the answer to both of those questions is no. But at some point, even the best among us can be pushed beyond the breaking point. See, it's what we do about it that matters. Now, I present this to you for three reasons. First of all, to help you mentally picture the context of this mob action against Paul. Second of all, to look with a little bit less disfavor upon the crowd of Jews that, that had been fed false information about Paul from their religious leaders. And to better understand the impossible circumstances that the Jewish followers of God were forced to live under. Third, to think carefully about how you should react as a believer to all that's happening around us today which has real parallels to what was going on in Paul's day. Well, Paul stood on the upper steps of the Antonia Fortress with Roman soldiers next to him. As he was given permission to speak to this mob who had intended to kill him. And speaking in either Aramaic or Hebrew, he began by using the same words that the martyr Stephen had used in his own defense. I think Paul wasn't thinking back to that. Paul addresses the people as brothers and fathers. Brothers, of course, are speaking of a mutual heritage. As Jews, fathers, avot in, in Hebrew, is speaking to the elders and the important people. Among the crowd. The crowd grew quiet to hear what else Paul had to say. So Paul's speech begins by explaining who he is, where he fits in traditional Jewish society. Now his purpose is to build a foundation to refute what these people have been told about him as he well understands their sensitivities. He presents his credentials 
as a natural born Hebrew by saying, indeed, he is a Jew. Explaining that he was born in Tarsus. That tells these Judean Jews that forms the bulk of the crowd that he is a diaspora Jew. Now, even so, he immediately adds that he spent a good deal of his upbringing right here in Jerusalem. He was taught by the highly venerated teacher, Gamaliel. Well, this identified Paul as not only having been immersed into the unique Holy Land Jewish culture, but also as a highly educated person. And it also identifies Paul as a Pharisee, which is, the most, uh, which is what most of the common people were if they carried any party affiliation at all. Now remember, it was the Pharisees who ran the synagogues. And virtually everyone present would have belonged to one synagogue or another. So this tells the crowd that his fundamental theological doctrines were essentially the same as theirs. Now Paul says that he was well educated in the details of the Torah of their fathers. In Greek it says in the nomos, the law of their fathers. By adding the words of our fathers, he means it in the sense of forefathers, not of the fathers that he was talking about a moment earlier in his audience. So he is more referring to the law of Moses than he is to halakha, Jewish law. Paul is claiming to be a Torah scholar. Well, he then goes on to explain about a dark side to his life, but one that the crowd wouldn't have found so distasteful. He explains that at first he was a persecutor of the way. Now, the tone in which Luke writes this account makes it clear that by now, the existence of this sect of Judaism known as the way was common knowledge. The sect had existed for 25 years. It was big. And no doubt, the basics of what this sect believed, that Yeshua was the Messiah, was also common knowledge. He also explains that, the, that, that his persecution of the way was accomplished on an official basis with the backing of the high priest and the Sanhedrin. Now, most Bibles will say the Council of Elders. Won't say the Sanhedrin. But because Paul mentions that the high priest is there along with the Council of Elders, then because the high priest is the head of the Sanhedrin, for sure, this is what Paul's referring to. So the mere fact that Paul was a representative of the Sanhedrin is further proof of his personal devotion to Jewishness and to Judaism. And the high priest himself, he says, could easily testify to the truth of this. Well, now that Paul has made his case that he's not only one of them, but he is actually in the upper ranks of Judaism and among the most zealous of religious Jews, in verse 5, he starts to tell the story of his encounter with the risen Christ. And as he was pursuing some fleeing members of the way, he says, he received letters of authorization as an agent directly working for the high priest to go to Damascus, Syria, to find and arrest any believers he encountered and bring them back to Jerusalem for prosecution. But on the road to Damascus, something startling happened to him. A blinding light appeared on the roadway that he and his traveling companions saw. It flashed all around the group, and as Paul fell to the ground, completely disoriented, he heard a voice from above speaking to him. And it said, why are you persecuting me? Now, Paul, not knowing whose voice it was, asked for some ID. And the response was equally as disorienting. I'm Yeshua from Nazareth. And you are persecuting me. Paul says that 
The witnesses to all this indeed were also stunned by the brilliance of this light. They heard Paul speaking, but they didn't see who it was that Paul was speaking to, nor did they hear any kind of a reply. Paul believed that what was happening was real and that the person who he was talking to was actually Yeshua of Nazareth, a man he well knew had died on a Roman execution stake. What he believed beyond that at this point is unknown to us. Well, a voice then issued an instruction. Get up, go into Damascus, and there you'll be told what your mission is to be. Wow! I mean, can you imagine this? All in one breath you're saved and then and, and told that shortly someone's going to tell you what God's purpose for your entire life is. What a deal! It didn't happen to me quite that way. Paul's still blind from this bright light. But he goes, led by the hand, to Damascus. There a man named Hananiah would restore Paul's sight and give him his marching orders as God's prophet. Now a sort of parenthetical comment in verse 12 says that Hananiah was an observant follower of the Torah. Hmm. This is something we mustn't pass by. Now, Hananiah was obviously a believer, but he was also an observant Jew who continued to follow the law. So in this chapter 22, we have Paul professing to be zealous for the law. We have the man whom Christ used to tell Paul his mission, Hananiah, who is also zealous for the law. See, I think it's pretty difficult to find the book of Acts thus far as telling modern believers that the law is bad, dead, and irrelevant. Rather, Luke clearly meant for us to know that Paul's commission that Yeshua said he would receive was given through the mouth of a pious, Torah-observant, believing Jew. Now, we are told that Hananiah was highly regarded by um, the entire Jewish community in Damascus. Now, no doubt it was because of his devotion to the law. But now Hananiah says something that's easy to overlook. He says that it is the God of our fathers who was the one who determined in advance that Paul should know God's will for his life. So it was the Father, Yehovah, who determined in advance that Paul would know God's will for his life. We now have God the Father and Yeshua the Son playing roles in this story, don't we? And they are separately spoken of in Acts chapter 22. Hananiah also tells Paul he will hear directly, audibly, from the righteous one or Tzaddik in Hebrew. Now this term, the righteous one, Tzaddik, is unusual. We really only find it in a couple of places in the Bible. And outside of Acts, I could only find it used once in Proverbs, twice in the book of Isaiah. That's it. What's fascinating is that the essence, the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, spoke regularly in their community documents about the expected coming of the Sodic, the righteous one. Damascus, interestingly, was the headquarters outside of the Holy Land for the Essenes. The Essenes was a faction of Judaism. It's also fair to say that when the theology of the Essenes is carefully studied, it has many similarities to the theology of the Pharisees. So I think with Hananiah's use of the term, the righteous one, Tzaddik, we are hearing overtones of Essen theology and terminology, and very probably Hananiah studied with the Essens in Damascus, as, by the way, it seems, did John the Baptist as well, but in Qumran, by the Dead Sea, not up in Damascus. There is not a shred of doubt in my mind that Yeshua spent time with the essence. 
Because we find him using terms in his Sermon on the Mount that not only were regularly used within the Essen community, but even a couple of unique terms that the Essens used to refer to themselves that are regularly preached on. You know what those terms are? The meek and the poor in spirit. Those were names that the Essens called themselves. And of course, Yeshua used those in the Sermon on the Mount, and there's been a lot of debate and argument about what he meant by that ever since. He was speaking about the essence. Paul's told that he's going to be a witness to everything he's seen and heard. Now, no doubt we do not have recorded for us everything he has seen and heard. So Hananiah instructs Paul to immerse himself. Now, self-immersion. That was the standard Jewish practice for immersion, for baptizing, rather than someone immersing them. And upon this immersion in Yeshua's name, Paul will have his sins washed away and therefore be prepared for his mission. Christ, Yeshua, is now the new dominant force in Paul's life. In verse 17, Paul advances his story to when he left Damascus, came back to Jerusalem. He says he was praying in the temple and he went into a trance. Now this is probably referring to when he came back to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 9, verse 26. Now notice how he weaves in this matter of the temple. Because recall, he'd been accused of one of the accusations against him was he was speaking against the temple. Now, here he's venerating the temple by praying there. And God validates Paul's pious prayers by giving him a vision. Now, this information would have greatly impressed Paul's listeners. Now, Paul also says that he saw him, God, and God told him to hurry and leave Jerusalem because the Jews there won't accept what Paul learned and experienced in Damascus. Who exactly did Paul claim to see? God the Father or God the Son? In what form? It's not clear. Paul attempted to convince the Lord to allow him to stay in Jerusalem by saying that the people would, would know who he is and therefore they'd be more easily convinced that this sudden change from his negative attitude and, and antagonism towards Yeshua in the way had to have been caused by nothing less than divine intervention. So perhaps they'll be more open to hearing from him. But the opposite happened, and the Lord was proved to be right. By knowing who Paul was before he turned to Yeshua, it made the believing Jews there too afraid of him to accept him. And it made the Hellenist Jews want to kill him. And Paul confesses to the crowd that he was far more than an innocent bystander in the death of Stephen. Even though Paul didn't directly participate in stoning Stephen, he helped those who did by holding their cloaks. And, admits Paul, he was in full agreement with the killing of Stephen. Well, God was having none of this argument Paul was presenting. He said, ah, be on your way. Paul is going to go far away to foreign lands now to witness to Gentiles. Well, apparently, <laughs> the last word out of Paul's mouth before the crowd again exploded into it, this incensed hysteria was Gentiles. The idea that Paul would take a means of salvation and deliverance to the enemy of the Jews, Gentiles, and that a Jewish Savior would be their means of salvation, whether or not the crowd even accepted such a thought, well, that was just too much. Verse 22 makes it clear that the primary issue was that the mob wanted him dead because of his association with Gentiles. These, these oppressed Jews, they, they couldn't stomach the notion. 
that God would give Gentiles equality with the Jews on account of his Messiah. There was just too much hatred against Gentiles to accept such a thing. Some began tearing at their clothing. Some ripped off part of their garments, waved them in the air, and we're told then they began to fling dust. It's quite impossible to determine with any certainty what this dust flinging was all about. Either it was throwing dirt because they didn't have any rocks handy to pelt Paul with, or it was a show of grief and devastation, a rather standard Jewish mourning tradition over Paul consorting with Gentiles. Perhaps it meant something else entirely different. I don't know. Well, seeing the crowd grow unruly again, Lysias had Paul brought in, inside the fortress with the intent to flog him in order to obtain the truth of Paul's offense. Well, so far, all Lysias knew was that Paul was not the Egyptian and that whatever it was that Paul had done, it was serious enough that a huge crowd was willing to risk Roman wrath coming down upon them for their civil disturbance. Now, it needs to be said that the type of flogging that the Romans inflicted upon a prisoner often as not resulted in death. See, it wasn't a whip like, like, like we might picture. Rather, the, device, the, the devices are called scourges or flagellum. It wasn't an instrument of discipline. It was one of torture. And it consisted of a wooden handle with long leather thongs and bits of sharpened metal or bone attached to the end. It tore at the flesh. It tore at the muscle tissue. It caused intense bleeding. If one survived it, they were usually disabled for life. The good news is that this is a form of treatment from which Roman citizens were exempt. So after being silent about it up to this point, as he's being stretched out and tied down for this whipping to begin, in verse 25, Paul asks a rhetorical question of one of his guards. Hey, is it lawful for you to flog a Roman citizen who's received no proper trial? Preparation came to a sudden halt. And the guard went to Commander Lysias and informed him that Paul claimed he was a Roman citizen. Of course, the Roman soldiers knew it was not legal for a Roman citizen to be flogged without a trial. So Lysias asked Paul if it was true. Paul replied it was. The commander made, made, made this odd response. He said, well, he said his citizenship cost him a great deal of money. The implication was, how could some poor Jew have enough money to buy Roman citizenship? Paul coolly replied, he was born into his Roman citizenship. He didn't have to buy it. This meant that Paul's father was a Roman citizen. Very unusual for a Jew. The result was, hmm, those soldiers immediately stopped what they were doing. And they even had Paul's chains removed because they had come perilous, perilously close to some very big trouble. See, had they done this to Paul, Roman law would have required that the soldiers have the same thing done to them. The problem is, the commander still doesn't know what it is that Paul did to cause all this mob action. So he puts Paul into a cell without any shackles, and he asked for the Sanhedrin to convene so that they could question him. One final comment. At this particular time, Judea was without a procurator, a provincial governor. For the moment, because he was the senior military man in Jerusalem, Lysias had nearly the authority of a procurator. So when he orders that the Sanhedrin is to meet, they have no choice in the matter. We're going to begin Acts chapter 23 next time as Paul is taken to the Sanhedrin for questioning.